I'm going to talk about um, four of them in depth today. Um, before I go in depth, I'm going to just go over all eight of these, just one slide a piece, because although I kind of define them according to, kind of, let's say, or I name them according to um, kind of geometry, let's say, uh, I'm really interested in maybe a larger concept that each one of these represents. Uh, so for shells, uh, what I've been very interested in with a number of projects is how do we integrate form, structure, and material? Um, and what can we learn from you know, this whole generation of uh, really disparate, diverse uh, engineers and architects and designers who were working from you know, the 19, 1900 roughly to 1970s or so, um, like Heinz Eisler, Friado, Candela, Gaudi, many others all over the world, who had basically focused on, on a material practice of architecture, um, where primarily they would focus on one particular material like wood or concrete or um, brick or something like that, and then push that material to the limit and see how to integrate that material with a certain performance, uh, and the resulting form comes out of that. So what I've been very interested in over the last um, 20 years or so is how uh, to um, extend that, the legacy of that um, generation of, of architects and designers and see how I can contribute to that through um, explorations within kind of both physical and, and digital um, design techniques. With she uh, cells, um, what I've primarily been interested in is just the, this kind of spectrum from uh, the modular to the kind of completely non-uniform. Um, and how do we deal with kind of difference within a project? That obviously along with difference comes uh, expense. And how do you um, produce something that appears that it has a high uh, level of difference and complexity, yet it has uh, maybe a high level of modularity at the same time? Um, so I'll show some projects that uh, with fields, um, I've been, uh, you know, like probably many of the faculty here have you know, taught over the years many kind of like intro educational uh, design classes and have gone through many different iterations of how to teach computational design. And um, uh, it, my current kind of pedagogy focuses on how, what's the relationship between kind of early um, computation in like the 1940s, 1950s, um, and um, fine art, uh, fine art movements from conceptual art and so forth. Uh, that a lot, they were both kind of thinking about a lot of similar ideas like recursion and, um, and uh, randomness. And so anyway, I've been using this pedagogically to teach my own students, uh, but then also uh, exploring kind of the, you know, why we draw. Um, basically, like there, I'll, I'll get into this in more depth in a few slides. Um, with stacks, uh, I've been, basically it's a self critique of my own work, but also kind of a whole generation of peers um, that with the introduction of digital design, um, there's a lot of talk about how sustainable it could be, but inevitably we end up with like a big sheet that we cut pieces out of, either CNC or flavor cut. And then all that, you know, if we're like lucky if we get 50% usage of material. Um, and that's not how we designed previously. And I, I, um, so much emphasis has been on form within this generation, uh, and that we can kind of produce any form, uh, which is, you know, partly true. Uh, it's kind of amazing that we can produce these, but we never really talk about the waste uh, that's involved in that process. Um, so a number of my projects, I've kind of tried to invert that and start from the material, the size of the piece of material uh, that it might come in, like a sheet of plywood or a board, and then um, work backwards from there and try to discover what forms could have 100% uh, material usage um, from that. Uh, with strands, uh, it's like a very basic idea in a way, it's just like that's existed throughout the history of architecture. Just how do you go from one thing to many, or how do you go from many to one? How do you bundle things together uh, in multiples? Um, they're just like really difficult geometric problems often, how to resolve kind of things that branch. Um, with news, uh, or things that are kind of inflated, either with air or with, um, with plaster or concrete, um, 
what I've been primarily interested in is just how do we give up control within the design process, process that design is inherently top down. You know, we're making decisions all along the way of what, what we care about and what we don't care about, and what material we want to use, what we don't, and so forth. Um, and, but at the same time, there are a lot of processes that are kind of bottom up. Um, and uh, how do we kind of release control? When do we release control? How much control should we release to these bottom up processes? Um, and then the last two are primarily pedagogical. Um, like Shelby said, I'm a full time uh, professor in California. And um, like probably many of you, um, at studios where uh, Basically, your professor is giving you a site and a program, and you spend the first few weeks of the term documenting the site, analyzing the program, and so forth, and then something magical is supposed to happen, and you have some concept that you pull out of that analysis, and you then develop a design based on that concept, and you get to the end of the term, and with too many of uh, my, my students, and my peer students at CCA, I always found that at the end of the term, like you'd ask the students what your project was made out of, how how was it made, and it'd be like, uh, um, and um, I find it really strange because there's a whole history of, like if you think of any architect throughout the history, uh, architectural history, like Mies, whoever, or um, they're associated with a certain material system, and they pursued that material system over and over again through different variations. And every time they got a new site, a new program, they manipulated kind of parametrically the material system that they had been investigating and made it work on that particular site and program. But for some reason, that's not how we teach architecture in schools anymore. Um, that we, don't, we tend not to think about a way of making as a starting point. We tend to think of uh, a form somehow as the starting point, and then we figure out, oh, should that form be concrete or steel or wood or so forth. So uh, in a number of projects, um, studios, I spend the first month of the term, uh, I tell students, um, pick any way of making. It could be something you're familiar with, it could be something you've never done before, like welding, or <coughs> casting, or steam bending wood, whatever it might be, and you need to make five 16 inch tall eggs. Um, every few days you need to make another one of these eggs. Um, and only at the end, basically, once they've kind of mastered it, and they're almost all failures. You know, every single one, they, they'll make an egg, it fails, and then we try to investigate why it failed, how they change the, the material in some way, or, or process, and, um, and then just remake the thing over and over again until they've kind of mastered a certain way of making. Only then do I give them the site and program, and then they have to kind of investigate how uh, to manipulate that, you know, kind of parametrically uh, the material system into something that works with that particular site and program. And what's been really interesting, uh, and I'm not sure if I should be proud of this or not, um, students who usually get A's in all of their other studios would get C's in the studio. And students who would get C's normally in their other studios would get A's in the studio. And, you know, like the A students were like, you know, very honestly frustrated because they're like, I just don't know what to do. Like, tell me what to do. Whereas, like, the, a lot of the students who maybe were like struggling in other studios, they're like, wait, I just get to focus on just making something and doing like just a good job of crafting something. And uh, it was amazing to see like the way that we were teaching was creating a certain type of student that could only work in a certain way. Um, so the other pedagogical kind of morphotype that I've been working with for the last four years uh, are these totems. So in addition to upper level advanced studios, uh, every year I teach the first studio for the MRC students. And these are people who have um, little to no background in architecture. Um, you know, some of them might be an English major or a biology major beforehand. So this is like their first class <coughs> in architecture. And kind of building on uh, the egg uh, kind of morphotype, I kind of expanded that into these totems where for the first eight weeks of the term, um, every two weeks we focus on a different material and they have to build um, these totems up. Uh, each, each section of the totem is essentially similar to a totem pole in uh, Pacific Northwest uh, Native American cultures, that the totems here are essentially monuments to what we as a community find valuable in the discipline. So each part of the totem is a different material that we, um, the discipline uses, so concrete, wood, steel, and then sheet materials like paper, plastics. 
Um, but then each one is also connected with a particular kind of what I have determined like essential conceptual tools within architecture, like figure ground or solid void or part to whole relationships, uh, surface and volume, um, the kind of tectonic, stereotonic from Frampton, and so forth. And we kind of do all the readings related to these and just work our way through until we get to eight weeks in. And then I tell them, by the way, these are actually a quarter inch and these are not 64 inch. Um, totems, these are 256 foot tall towers and you need to build circulation systems for it and then they have to do six foot tall section drawings and uh, six foot tall exploded isometrics, uh, or isometrics at the end that analyze it. So rather than starting the process with analysis, we end the process kind of with like a self-reflection of like what they've done in that term and they have to kind of break it down and try to pull the project through the history of architecture and make connections. Um, okay, so I won't talk about most of those uh, for the rest of the lecture, uh, so I'll jump into the four more prototypes I will. So the first one is fields. Um, so like I said, uh, <coughs> over the last 20 years or so, you know, from like Columbia's paperless studio in the late 90s uh, to kind of the design to production kind of um, discussion of a lot of kind of digitally fabricated projects uh, to um, building information, uh, modeling, uh, workflows, that we basically changed the way that we work as a discipline. You know, for hundreds of years, drawings were the generative tool that we used to explore uh, design possibilities. And from those drawings, we produce models or we produce buildings, right? Um, now, drawings are essentially automated. Like for those of you who know Revit really well, you're basically spending all of your time modeling and then working out the ways that that model is sliced and diced and the algorithms then automatically produce the details and the, the sections, excuse me. Um, and uh, you know, for some projects, uh, you, or for all projects, you need drawings for permitting. So essentially drawings, instead of being generative, they've been relegated to kind of legalistic purposes and sometimes for fabrication for certain types of machines, uh, you still need drawings. But essentially models produce drawings. So this is this huge paradigm shift within the discipline. So what I've been interested in is, you know, do we accept this? You know, do we just say let's stop drawing, or you know, like let's just go all in on the model as the generator, um, or is there a way that we can re-engage drawing in in various different ways? Like, do we really need to hand draw more? You know, learn how to sketch, um, or do we need to engage the active drawing through algorithm rather than the algorithm being kind of the output? You know, like the algorithm taking the model and turning it into a drawing. Can we use algorithms to create drawings and almost sketch with code? Um, so um, in a lot of the classes that I teach, like I was saying, I go back to kind of the history of uh, minimalist and conceptual art with people like Sol Witt, Ava Hess, um, Elsworth Kelly, um, who were developing their work. They weren't developing it with computers, but they were com computation was in the air. Right? Um, and you know, some of like Ellsworth Kelly is not this particular one, but some of the color ones, they're almost indistinguishable from like a pixelated drawing. And like, yeah, even the idea of a pixel hadn't existed yet. Um, but then along the bottom row here, they're all, you know, cut off a little bit, but I'll read the names to you. Um, there are a number of computer scientists who were working roughly at the same time in the 1950s through 70s. Um, uh, uh, Manfred Moore, Edward Zazek, uh, Vera Muller. Um, who had jobs at you know, Xerox and IBM and things like that, and at night they would just use these massive main mainframes to do art, which I find really exciting. Um, and so all of these were made artworks made by computer scientists um, with computers, and the top row are artists who were not working with computers, but conceptually, I think, were primarily thinking digitally about their work. Um, that they were thinking through a set of rules to make the art. So I use these as examples and I kind of, instead of like, I used to teach computational design, I'd give students like the Birkin in London or you know, like some famous building of computational design and say, okay, we're gonna learn how to model this. Um, and after a few years of that, I had a student come up to me and or we were talking in a desk trip and he said, um, well, I suggested that they use Grasshopper to do something. And it wasn't you know, anything geometrically complex. Um, but it was, uh, information-wise, it was complex, so I suggested to use Grasshopper. And he said, oh, well, I didn't really learn that. I'm like, yeah, you did. Like, everyone has to take this required class. Like, 
I know you've taken the bus. And he's like, yeah, well, I just didn't pay attention because I just don't like Twisted Towers and like Gary's work and Zaha's work, so I just decided not to learn it. And I realized that that was a huge failure on my own part and my peers' part at CCA. And we made this big shift where like, we're not gonna teach, we were basically, even though in our minds, uh, the computational design and parametricism in the kind of Patrick Schumacher sense, um, the style of parametric design and computational design were not united in our minds. For students, they saw, if you use these tools, you're gonna do that type of work. And the students like, I don't like Twisted Towers, so why should I learn these tools? So we completely shifted the way that we taught, and we now only teach through like these examples of paintings and drawings from the 50s, basically. And we say, can you recreate this painting um, using a robot holding a brush? And you need to create 10 different variations of the robot, or, uh, or of the drawing using the robot. And so that they have to kind of generatively design the algorithm, they have to kind of analyze the, the painting and then figure out what the algorithm is and then create a machine that can create endless variations of those. Um, and then in my own work, um, I've been pursuing this through a number of projects and I'm not gonna go through all of them, but of like forcing myself to learn how to draw with a robot and like understanding a different body and how another body of another thing uh, has its own particular way of drawing, um, that both in code, but also in, in its kinematics. Um, uh, and then my colleague and I at CCA, Adam Marcus, decided to, maybe two years ago, um, curate a exhibition where we commissioned 24 drawings from different emerging architects uh, and established architects um, from around the country. Uh, it's called Drawing Codes, um, and we're the latest version, so we just opened up a new volume of the show, another new 24 drawings at Cooper Union. Uh, it's opening UVA uh, in about a month at uh, University of Virginia. So basically we asked uh, all of 24 people to engage the act of drawing and code in some way. Uh, it could be zoning codes, it could be building codes, permitting, it could be political uh, census kind of codes. Um, it could be literal you know, scripting, it could be robotic uh, control, um, and so forth. Um, so I'm not going to go over all the different drawings, um, but we, all the drawings have to be 25 inches by 25 inches. They all have to be black and white. They all have to be orthographic, which a few people broke that rule. Um, and it was really interesting because it basically allowed us in the curriculum of the school to be, engage our own students and talk about all the different ways that you can engage computation without making the student tower. Um, that, uh, so for my own, I, I commissioned myself. Um, and uh, this was uh, my submission to the exhibition uh, called The Walled City. Um, this was done, uh, I did it right after Trump was elected, but before he was inaugurated. And um, obviously the word wall, you know, the wall was in the air everywhere. Everyone was talking about the wall. Um, and I was just thinking kind of conceptually about what a wall is, that obviously the way that it's commonly used, that we use it as a way to kind of divide you know, one space from another, or one people from another, one program from another. Um, and I started to think about how I could kind of create a fictitious, fictitious city, almost like along the lines of like Palomino's of Invisible Cities, uh, or like a Borges story, um, of like a parable essentially. Uh, so in this parable, the idea was to create a city that uh, its wall, if you imagine like a medieval city, where there's a wall around the city, and the city's in the center, uh, in this case, the wall got kind of greedy in a way and decided to kind of consume the entire city. So it, um, so um, I used uh, an algorithm to essentially start with this wall that its goal is to kind of um, increasingly over time uh, get longer and consume more space without intersecting itself. Um, and it had to stay within a certain volume, so you'll see in a minute here as it begins to hit that square border, um, that it starts to kind of fold back in on itself even more. Um, so it was all, the goal was also to kind of confuse inside and outside, so rather than a wall, like the wall between the US and Mexico or something like that in Trump's um, terminology, that this was a wall that was like, you wouldn't even really know what side of the wall you were on. You could be in the dead center of the city, 
that could literally be on the outside of the city, right? Like, so this, this point right here in the center is outside of the city. Uh, it's outside of the wall boundary. Uh, or this part way over here is all the way in the city, and then maybe this neighbor and this neighbor, even though they're right next to each other in space, they're actually very far away from each other in transportation. Um, so then the challenge was how do you show a city? Like it couldn't just be a wall. Like how do you actually demonstrate through one drawing um, and without modeling anything in just a plan drawing that this would be a city? So I got kind of stuck and I needed kind of inspiration. So I started typing into Google um, uh, rooftop and I realized that Google was giving me all of these auto suggestions. Like if I started, if I typed in rooftop space Y, it came up with rooftop yoga. Um, so I decided to type um, all the letters, uh, the 26 letters, and then just based on whatever Google suggestions came up, I would choose the one that was the most architectural, and then develop an algorithm that would um, array that, that program, that rooftop program along it. So basically all of these swimming pools are all exactly the same code, but based on the different outline that they're having to deal with, they have to kind of snake around in different ways. Um, so the other kind of more like goal for my own myself, because it's not really important for, for all of you, um, but I wanted to kind of push myself to um, to produce a, an entire drawing only through code. So I didn't actually draw anything here. I just wrote code and the different parameters and everything was automatically generated. And I did this just for my own kind of sake of learning. Like if you push yourself to do something and force, use just one tool to do it, um, you are forced to kind of like learn new ways of using that tool. So like just little silly things of like, okay, how do you make it look like there's a protest going on? of a number of people. What does a crowd look like? How do you model a crowd? Uh, and other little things like that. Um, okay, so that, uh, moving on to the next uh, morphotype, the strands. Um, I'll mostly talk about this project that I did two years ago, or three years ago now, almost um, in Miami. Uh, but before that, I'll get to some of the kind of precursor projects. So um, I've been working with some students in Bond University in Australia when I was on the sabbatical about four years five years ago, I guess now. And we developed this kind of uh, material system where if you um, take these thin plastic sheets and push them, uh, you rivet them together so that they have curvature both along their length, but also by having the kind of plane to plane kind of connection. Um, you're, but it's a triangular section. You're essentially forcing across that section from being a triangle to being kind of this rounded kind of, I don't know what you call it, um, these crescent-shaped triangle sections. Um, and all that double curvature, um, even though it's like super weak, cheap material, it's like HDPE, like what milk jugs are made out of, um, these like six foot tall pieces, if you just put one on one table, one end on one table, and one on the other, you could sit on them. Um, they're incredibly lightweight, hollow box beams, and because of their double, double curvature, they end up having a lot of strength. So we scaled that up really high um, and put lights inside of them for an exhibition or installation we did um, right under the uh, Sydney Harbor Bridge for um, a lighting festival there. Um, and uh, I then came back and at the same time I was really interested in how to manipulate, how to use um, 3D printing instead of like importing in an object into a, a program and slicing it. Uh, I wanted to learn how to manipulate the movement of the extruder so that I was essentially kind of almost weaving, not really weaving, but depositing the tool paths in a very particular way. So this is like a microscopic or macroscopic image that's about an eighth of an inch tall, um, that whole like, band of seven or so um, strands. Um, so I had a much, much more control over these strands. Um, so then I was commissioned by uh, the Champagne Company, Perry Jouet, to do a installation in, at Design Miami, which is Design Miami, you shouldn't go if you get a chance, it's always around Thanksgiving in Miami, um, good time to um, go. And uh, it's a basically massive design fair where different design galleries bring, you know, some of it like mid-century furniture, but a lot of it contemporary furniture. Um, and it's like a very strange space because it's like a massive convention hall 
and you're wandering around and there's like every famous chair you've ever seen, plus all these new chairs and tables and all this, and it'll be like a, like a Nakashima bench that's like $60,000 for a bench or something. And you're just like, oh my god, like you're, you're just like overwhelmed by the amount of amazing design that you're seeing in one place. But you can't sit anywhere, and you're dead tired. And there's just people, you're just like, you know, compressed, just, you know, you feel like you're at a concert or something. And um, so I went the previous year to get a feel for it, and I was just very kind of anxious by what was going on. Um, uh, on top of that, like, I was asked by the Champagne Company to reflect on their collection. They, um, they were founded over 200 years ago, and I guess the grandchildren of the founders around the 19, 1890s, they started collecting a lot of Art Nouveau and to the, like 1910 or so. Um, they have the largest private collection of Art Nouveau furniture and paintings and design um, in the world. Um, so I got to visit their, their house in France and look at a lot of the Art Nouveau work, and they wanted me to kind of produce something that was inspired by their collection. And when you look at a lot of Art Nouveau work, architecture or, or paintings or prints, um, furniture, one of the, the themes that you see in a lot of the work, I should have an image in here to show you, but you see often it's like a woman's hair, like a strand of hair that then turns into a grapevine, that then turns into the wind, or something, it's like very ambiguous kind of curvilinear elements that are like branching, coming together, and bundling, and swirling around to have this like organic kind of vitality to the, the work. Um, and so I wanted to kind of work with this idea of these strands and, um, and do it in these four different kind of projects. So there are, um, there are three um, screens, which are these kind of cellular looking things. Uh, there are um, a bench or a series of stools that can aggregate into a longer bench, a table, and then a nice bucket. So most of the booths in the, at Design Miami, they basically don't have this front wall, because obviously the owners of the gallery want you to see the work as soon as you walk by. But my goal, I wasn't selling anything, but these gallery owners were. Um, we just wanted to create a moment, like a moment of calm, almost like a clearing in a forest. Um, where, so instead of like showing everything off, we, I put these screens in the way and then put this wall, so that you basically don't see the space, you have to kind of wander around and you get into the space and then you can sit and have a glass of champagne and uh, rest for a while. The whole room is painted black and, and just very minimal, um, this kind of soothing, uh, glowing light coming out of the pieces. So for the, the, um, the, the main screens, I wanted to work with oak wood, which is the main wood used with the pressing of the grapes. Um, and I used, a mater used the material previously on this project in 2012. Um, but this whole thing was glued together, all of the veneer, and I wanted to come up with a system that um, I could cr um, create the whole thing without any glue or any kind of hardware. So I came up with this like tab system where you just kind of push one tab and it's almost like a zipper, um, uh, which, um, which uh, highly recommend if you don't have this tool for your CNC, I recommend it, it's only a few hundred dollars and basically puts an X-Acto knife on the end of your CNC router, um, and it allows you to cut lots of thin material and fabrics and things like that. Um, so learning how to program this was really interesting because the, the actual point, it's a little hard to tell, it's almost like a caster on a, on a chair, but the point of the blade is actually an eighth of an inch behind the center point of the router, um, that it's essentially um, trailing, it's almost like a, like a, a weather vane, that the weather vane always points in the direction of least resistance, and the, this, the exacto blade always points in the direction of least resistance, and like the, the tangent of the movement, the vector of the movement. So um, I was able to use that and cut out all of these long strips and then zipper them together um, and put an LED light within the inside of it that was kind of very slowly modulating its brightness. Um, so it produced this kind of um, this effect that almost in the end, which was not intentional, these like these little bubbles of light going up the side of like the glass of a champagne. Um, that I only thought of that afterwards. Um, this is a time lapse video to start it, where you can see how they subtly shift in um, brightness. So I wanted it to be slow enough that people wouldn't realize that it was happening um, on a conscious level, but on a subconscious level, you have this feeling of this like subtle shifting and this kind of organic 
kind of movement going on in space. Um, the benches were uh, cast out of concrete, um, using a very white concrete to make it look like the chalk caves the, um, the, the champagne is stored in um, for sometimes decades. Um, and the, the way that this is made, it's essentially, this is a tutorial I do with my students, um, where any three points, let's see three points in a moment, if you take any three points and then take the midpoint of each of those sides and project out to these other points, such that that's 120 degree angle, you end up with a, um, a hexagon that uh, tiles with itself uh, endlessly. So you can see that here, that these are all exactly the same shapes. They look different to your eye, but they're all identical. Um, so I was able to use one of these uh, irregular hexagons to as the base for the um, stool, and then this you can see how they um, uh, tile with each other. Or you can see here we just had to then make only one mold. So we CNC mill uh, um, foam positive, and then make plaster um, jacket or plaster mold around that, uh, and then cast concrete um, uh, with uh, like a white concrete with these kind of dark flecks in it to again mirror the the chalk caves of the. Uh, Client's uh, collection. Um, and then again, look at oak top uh, to each of these so that the people in the space can kind of move them around as they needed to have a long bench or individual benches. The um, uh, table in the center, um, I wanted to kind of reference uh, two different things. One was the kind of glass itself, the champagne glass but also the traditional baskets that the um, laborers would use in the fields to collect all of the grapes. The, they had a collection of all of these amazing baskets and how they were woven. Um, so I worked again with the, um, the custom G-code, um, the writing room G-code, in order to 3D print this kind of space frame that works its way up. So as it drapes from one level to another, they end up um, joining with each other and making this very strong um, structure, this double wall uh, structure. Um, so I made seven of those on uh, emerging objects, um, massive um, director bot, which is a four foot by eight foot by four foot high 3D printer. Um, so these were between 40 to 60, I think five hour prints. Um, and then these little joints um, connect them and then hold the LED, LED lights uh, on the inside within the oak tops. Um, so the idea is that it's like, instead of one table, it's almost like these seven table legs that just join kind of temporarily together uh, to make this cluster of, of uh, cocktail table uh, cluster. So finally, the, um, the ice bucket, since it's the thing that's like most, like it's physically uh, closest to the, the champagne, I wanted it to be most closely related to the champagne. Um, so when grapes are pressed, you know, the, the juice of the grape goes on to, be, to make the champagne or the wine. Um, but the solid part of the grape, the skin and seeds and the stems and things like that, um, get taken out of the, the press and um, often either thrown away or turned into compost. Um, and amazingly, uh, you can find almost anything in the Bay Area. There was a startup that was trying to take the waste materials from the wineries in the Bay Area and create gluten-free flowers that they were selling at Whole Foods. Um, so they were, you could basically buy at Whole Foods like Chardonnay flour or Pinot Noir flour and um, things like Merlot flour and so forth. Um, and so I contacted the company and I told them what I was doing and they gave me a huge uh, bucket loads of, of their flour which we were then able to put in the 3D printer and um, 3D print um, these petals of the, log, or of the, the ice bucket. Um, and then the surface texture on it, I wanted it since like, if you think of the, the, the bottle, inside of the bottle is the liquid essence of the champagne, I wanted the ice bucket that holds that bottle to be the solid essence of, of the champagne, or the solid essence, I should say of the grape. The liquid essence of the grape and the solid essence of the grape. So the idea that these, this, this compost, or what was normally composted, is instead put in a kiln and dried and then ground up into a powder. So the idea was to almost take this like raisin-like, you know, dried grape skin uh, exterior. And this is the final um, piece. Um, and Shelby asked she, she, before, she's like, I want to hear all the secrets, so I'll tell you one secret. Um, see this little, like, blush on the 
outside here. Um, while I was making, so we, we, I dipped the, the, the petals in resin to harden them and make them waterproof. Um, uh, but apparently it wasn't super waterproof. So some of the water got to the inside of the um, print and there were probably lots of microorganisms that were living on the surface of the grape um, that then uh, got ground up and whatever, you know, in that process and somehow survived that whole process. So when they got wet, this whole culture of some type of organism is actually growing throughout the inside of that bucket. <laughs> um, so it's not painted, that's actually some other organism painting itself. Um, okay, so news. Uh, the people in the workshop already heard a lot of this, so I'll go a little quickly on it. Um, but I was, a number of years ago, uh, working with these um, simulations of minimal surfaces within the computer. And one day I was uh, walking by um, the Yale uh, Art and Art Center, uh, Art and Architecture uh, building by Rudolph, and I saw this sculpture that I still haven't figured out who did it, maybe Rudolph did it. Um, but uh, it's this really beautiful fabric formed concrete column. And because I had been working with um, this dynamic relaxation technique within the computer, I just thought, oh, I can do this. I'll try to put some fabric between two surfaces and cast some plaster in it. Unfortunately, this is what I ended up with. Um, and I was really, it was my first week as a uh, professor um, at Ohio State. I'm very embarrassed um, that I made something that, if you're generous, looks like a belly button. Um, and it's wrinkly and it's blemished and folds, and it just did not look like the perfect thing I had to make. And I was really kind of depressed, and I hid it away, and I kept on trying again and again with even more complex casting techniques that didn't make any sense. Um, and none of them worked, and it was just a big failure. And I was sitting in my office looking at this thing, and I was like, okay, maybe it's ugly, and I'm embarrassed of having this thing, um, and making it and being a total failure. Um, but it's something, it's, it's surprising. I did not intend to do that. I intended to do something that was perfectly smooth and digital, you know, it had the aesthetic of something digital, um, and this was resisting all of that. So I decided, like, well, maybe it's ugly at this scale, just one, <coughs> but I made hundreds of them. Um, and at that time, I discovered the work of Miguel Fisak, uh, who worked from the 1940s until, I don't know, he died around 2011, I think, uh, but most of his work was finished by the 19, early 1980s. Um, and he had developed in the 1940s this technique of casting against um, canvas and chicken wire, uh, or rope, or, or sometimes plastic sheeting, because it was a, a sustainable way to um, not waste a bunch of material with casting into plywood. And he produced these amazing, these amazing pieces, but they were often very repetitive. Uh, so what I was trying to do with my project was develop a way to work from kind of a, a painting, essentially, and to subdivide that painting into a series of um, points, almost like a stipple drawing, where the black areas, the points are much denser, and the white areas, they're much um, further apart. And the density of that was based on experiments of like, if the points were too close, the cast would fail. If the points were too far away, the cast would fail. So based on some early experiments, I then used this painting and a script I wrote to, to produce this stipple pattern, and printed these all out on paper, and hand drilled them into MDF, um, and then cast these 30 panels, which all the students who are in the workshop uh, are very familiar with this from, this was 2005 or so, I guess maybe January 2006. Um, and uh, so you peel off the fabric, wash the fabric, reuse it, so it, it requires very, very little form work. Um, and what was I thought really interesting was that when people came into the gallery to see this for the first time at Ohio State, they were all like, what kind of axis, how many axes robots do you have? Like, how did we get these super thin, um, you know, that must have taken forever to mill. Um, and it just taught me something that I had no idea how to model this. If I even wanted to mill it, you know, I would have no idea how to model it at the time. And um, that it produced forms that were novel, that were beautiful, that were ugly, um, that were um, just a bunch of different things that were always surprising every time we, we, we turned it over and peeled the fabric off. We were always just amazed at, at what we were getting. And in that process, I had some control. Um, you know, I controlled the size of the frame, controlled how many points, 
where the points were, but even if I used exactly the same frame and exactly the same points, each cast would look completely different. So in 2009, I was commissioned by SF MoMA to do a much larger wall, 45 feet long and 12 feet high. So instead of using this like very fragmented, high contrast painting, um, I used a much more diffuse kind of sine wave of just like a black line that has a very high gradient going to these white areas. Um, which in effect, if you can imagine like the black areas or the areas that are like shallowest, um, but, but very ripply, and the areas that were white are projecting out of the screen in these very large mounds. So in, in effect, the whole wall is kind of oscillating in section, um, the wall section this way. Um, so there are a number of things I wanted to work with um, to change the wall from the previous one. The first was that the space was primarily, in, in the original one in 2006, you looked at the wall frontally, but in 2009, you looked at the wall obliquely because it was in a hallway. So you could never get you know, more than eight feet away from the wall. Um, so the primary view is this type of view, looking obliquely. So I wanted to get rid of the seam. Uh, I liked how like here, you just it, all the vertical seams just blend together and it looks like this kind of endless landscape of, of hills or clouds or whatever you want. Um, so